Hello and welcome to another podcast for National Inset Week 2014. I'm joined by Graham Smith today, who is a co-founder of metamorphosis.gb.com. They are lead insect breeders and invertebrate breeders and suppliers. So, Graham, thank you very much for joining me today. Always a pleasure. So, first of all, how did you get into the breeding business? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I used to work as a zookeeper. I progressed from there. I've always been keeper of reptiles. As a lad, my brother and myself had a massive collection of reptiles, 19 species of crocodilian, um, but we were breeding them back in the early 80s, and it's all—it's now formative stuff that I wanted to do. So we were doing it with the reptiles back then. Inverts have been pretty much untouched, and although we've always kept them, people weren't breeding them. So slowly the importers were bringing in the odd, unusual invert. Uh, and we started to keep them and then slowly learn how to breed them. Then we learned how important these things are and just progressed with them. So originally were these imports that you say, they were brought in from the wild as these, the first collections? That yeah, most of the original inverts, uh, the beetles, the mantids, the spiders were all taken from the wild, <coughs> which really goes against the grain. So what we wanted to do was to learn how to breed them. And once you learn how to breed them, you can supply the pet trade you can supply people who want to study them because you've now learned all of the little nuances of the individuals and share that information with other people. So uh, we were breeding um, yes, scorpions early on, spiders, lots of different species of mantids. You had these imports, you had to learn yep. how to breed them. Yep. Was there some information in the past that you could build on or was this totally new for you? You had to learn mm. it by trial and error. New trial and error. Working on the premise that if you know roughly where they come from, you can work out environmental conditions. If you can give enough variation within a known environmental region, you can find out where they live. So we'd start with big tanks. A pair of praying mantids would have a six foot by three foot tank, six feet high. Um, you'd release them with dry areas and tr lush tropical areas and sunshine areas and wet areas uh, and see where they go and live. And then slowly you can make that cage smaller and smaller until you get the optimum conditions for individual species. And it works with all of them. Not just mantids, it works with stick insects, it works with beetles, it's, it's great fun. So did you have to observe them quite a lot? You have to yeah, we, we spend a lot of time, whenever we go into the tropics, whenever we go into Europe, Europe's my favourite place, uh, you sit and watch a species. And if you can spend all day sitting watching a species, you can learn enormous amounts. So at the moment we're at Butterfly World. Yep. Um, in St Albans, yep. we have a. What, 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 describe to us what you've brought along for your <laughs> event. Uh, today's exhibit that we've brought along is Conservation Day, Butterfly Conservation Day. Uh, today's exhibit is bigger than any insect house in the UK. More, more specimens on display, more species on display. Um, and we do that so that you can get hands on. If you want to hold one of the bugs that's handleable, fine. We bring lots and lots along so we rotate them during the day. Uh, strange enough, snails have been the big draw of the day today, <laughs> giant landscapes. Um, millipedes are always good. But it means you can come along and meet one of the world's largest cockroaches in the, in the giant cave cockroach. And next to it we've put the banana cockroach, one of the smallest cockroaches, one of the smaller cockroaches. So that people can see the diversity. We can also talk about uh, that these are farmers, these are not nasty pest species. These are things that are going to live in the leaf litter under a tree, they're going to take all of the bits that fall off the tree, the fruit, dead animals, dead leaves and wood, convert it into usable soil and then that makes the tree do better the following year so then they do better the year after. So it's a complete farming cycle of cockroaches that when people first meet them they all go, ugh, yeah. cockroach, <laughs> and then we spend the time talking to them. Uh, but yeah, yeah well, we, we kind of want the oo because it's from that oo that allows us to give them the story of why they're not so bad. Do you feel like you can convert them by the end of the day? Oh, yeah, if, if I can convert one at each exhibit, we do a lot of these, then I think we've got to win. Your favourite are... Uh, what, what, what's oh, your favourite? The mantids. The mantids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's how I started, so I suppose I'm biased though. Yeah. So these are the ones you find are most popular as well, that, um, that most people want to know about the mantids, want to, want to buy the mantids, want to uh, keep and to breed the mantids? Yes, mantids have been the most popular uh, new species to new keepers. Stick insects used to be, 
Um, but lots of people, lots of schools have stick insects and they're kind of sedentary. Spiders are big business uh, financially, but it's something we try and avoid. Uh, one of the dangers, particularly with breeding, is the price brackets people set. Uh, we've always worked on the premise that if you keep the prices low, but not silly low, these things have to have a price bracket because otherwise they're not worth protecting. Some spider species are fetching large sums of money, which really feeds the trade we don't want, which is the wild court stock. So things like brachypelmas, which are now a CITES restricted species. So what kind of um, spiders are these? Uh, brachypelma, um, a, a ground-dwelling theraphosid, normally of the North American continent. Um, big, quite brightly coloured, not the best of pet species. They tend to flick hairs, which are irritating. Uh, not vicious, but, but a good looking spider. And it used to be that the, the bread and butter of the pet trade, really, it was uh, everyone knew the red knee tarantula, it was the traditional one. That got so wiped out in the wild. They take, uh, our breeding stock takes five, five to seven years to get a female big enough to breed, and then it takes a two year cycle to get her ready for egg laying. Um, but these things were being wiped from the wild because they fetch reasonably large sums of money. An adult would be probably close to £100. Exactly, so yeah, these wow. things are potentially money spinners. So what we do is we breed and then make sure that they're affordable, so they're cheap. It kills the export market. You can't smuggle them in to make them saleable so that you can make it an illegal trade. So breeding can actually be beneficial to the wild status yeah. of species. Yeah, and, and the pet trade. For, for years we've separated the pet trade from the zoo trade, and the pet trade is always seen as this, this ogre that's going to strip the wild and it's bad, we shouldn't be keeping things. Uh, and I always say to that, well, if we didn't have things in, cap, in, in culture, we wouldn't understand the nuances on how we keep and breed things. So once you know what they need to trigger, you can identify what's happening in the wild state. So it's important to have culture stock. It's important to have culture stock because we need to get the next generation infused by keeping things, because without keeping things, they're just a picture in a book. Uh, without hands-on, even in zoos, bless them, zoos are great but they're a little bit Victorian. We need to bring them up to date. Oxford Museum, Natural History Museum, is probably the best forward-thinking museum I've come across because they'll intersperse livestock with dead stock to give it back its validity, to give it back that life essence. So you've been breeding insects for yep. a very long time yeah, for and other invertebrates yep. for for the zoo and then in, into as, as a kid and yeah. then further on now. What species stand out to you as particularly fascinating in the way they reproduce and, and why, the way you have to, to keep them? Oh, good question. Probably some of the orthopterans we're breeding. We're breeding some of the giant grasshoppers. Getting the right conditions to get them to lay has been difficult and then getting the eggs held in the right manner. Some of them need diapausing, some uh, environmental triggers. So it took ages to actually identify things like uh, the Tropidacris, which is a giant species of South American, one of the biggest grasshoppers. And we've got some there today, and, the, and everyone, wow, giant grasshoppers. Uh, and the ones we've got here today are not as big as they end up. To get the egg cases right, you have to run through a dry spell, then a wet spell, then another dry spell, then they hatch on the next wet one. But it took ages to work that out. So how long can it take sometimes? From the first the first stop that you get, you've got to work out, you know nothing, or maybe you have your inklings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long can it take sometimes to get it right? Uh, some of the original beetles we were breeding, some of the dynasties, probably 15 years before we had lots of excess. Uh, the orthopterids, the big tropidacris, we're now into about six, seven years and now we've mastered it and now we share that with people. So now you'll see the numbers in the UK and Europe and probably America as well because we're shipping some over. The numbers will start to rise now in captivity. So they should become a standard zoo exhibit, the giant grasshopper. And you get lots of wow from it. So it takes a long time to get them right, but we also share the information we've got. We come across a species that we think we know roughly how it's going to work, but we also have somebody enthusiastic that wants to take it on, then we'll set them up breeding it. Um, 
And I've got a new giant species from the um, northeast of Thailand, which is the biggest mantis I've ever kept. It's the only mantis that had me squealing like a girl. Um, and in fact, if a mantis bites you, if you put your hand into a cage and they grab you, they think you're food, normally they'll grab and then let go. This one, it's a rhombodera. It'll grab, it will sink the spikes all the way in, and it will then take out lumps of meat, and they're about the size of a match head, and it will eat them. It will hang on to you, and it will eat them quite happily, swallow them, and then go for the next bit. So how big is this mantis? Uh, its head is a centimetre, or maybe a centimetre and a quarter across, so, so a centimetre and a quarter, let's split it. Uh, 12 mil, 13 mil across the head. Big, big head. A big mantis, full length of the mantis, uh, certainly pushing towards 15 centimetres, enormous, but stocky with it, not long and thin, stocky. Um, and that was the only mantis that, I, if you get bitten by a mantis, you have to take a pencil and slide it between the mantis head and your, your body so you don't, don't hurt it, you can't take its arms off. Uh, and I was calling down the insect house for Janice to bring me a pencil so I could stop it from biting me, and she couldn't bring it because she was laughing so much because I was squealing. <laughs> These uh, are the dangers of the profession. The dangers the of the profession. Yeah. But, but brand new species, a really exciting species. It's not one I would allow as a pet species because it does bite. We try and do smaller, safer, stable in culture species. What advice could you give to any new budding listeners out there who want to breed their own insects? What's a good species to start with? good species to start. It depends what fires you up. You have to look at the groups that fire you up. Inverts, the inverts are so diverse. Uh, if you're going to do mantids, uh, I'm biased. Swadra mantis, lineola, one of the African mantids. Good size, easy to keep, non-problematic molting. Brilliant species. Um, and it's what I started with, so I kind of sell it to everybody. It's uh, close to your heart, this oh, one. Oh, totally, totally. It's got all the right attributes of a mantis. Variable colour that you can change between molts, so that you can play with the jungle adaptations. How um, do you do this? Uh, they come from areas in Africa that are prone to dry season, and dry season causes leaf fall. So leaves fall from the trees, uh, light level increases, uh, temperature goes up because you've lost the transpiration from the leaves. So you've now got higher light level, lower, temp uh, lower humidity, higher temperature, mantis goes brown between molts. Uh, if it was a green bud, everything would eat it, herbivora and carnivore. Um, so the monkeys would spot the mile off as a bud. Um, reverse that system, so lower the light level, up to humidity, then lower the temperature, and you get these wonderful greens. It's environmental colours, and swaddies are brilliant to do. But also, if you play with the levels of colour, but the light levels between, I've produced pale orange, almost white, this or oh, wonderful cream beige magnolia colour. They're great fun, man. So you can experiment with your mouth. Oh, that's, that's what I spend my life doing. I, I play to see how how they work, what triggers them. Uh, I do it with all species. Then I keep I've got notebooks all over the place with my notations. So you've been experimenting with your mantids yep. for years. Yep. What is the one thing that blew your mind away when you when you discovered something that completely uh, surprised you? Something I haven't actually written up at all yet, or got other people to do yet, um, is the barometric pressure triggers on the Uthicus hatching. I couldn't work out why I got blank spots. I, I probably pick uh, 10 Uthicus a day, 10 egg masses a day, from various species. And every now and then I would get a blank. You'd expect hatchings most days, but you'd go through a week with no hatchings or ten days and start to worry what's gone wrong. Have I got parasites in? Uh, you start pulling them apart with the hand lens looking for mites. And then I started looking at barometric pressures and realised that when we hit low pressure, we were getting hatchings. High pressure, restricted hatchings. And then you start looking at environmental conditions. Uh, low pressure indicates you've got a rain front coming. Nymphs hatching, if they hatched in desiccate conditions, die within hours. They dry out. So they're using the barometric pressure change as an indicator that there's going to be moisture, which also means small prey available for them, for hatching. Great trigger. Nature at its best. So now, final question. Good. Entomologists listening now, new generation, and also perhaps parents. Yep wanting to buy their kid the first pet, hmm. why should they get insects? 
rather than a hamster or a puppy. Oh, that's easy. That's easy. Uh, if you choose an insect that is of a one-year cycle and start it along that cycle, uh, the caging is inexpensive. The upkeep is inexpensive. Uh, you can still take holidays. You can either take it with you if you're in, in the UK. Uh, but most inverts can be set up quite happily to be left alone for a week or two, depending on what it is. Um, and if the kitty gets into keeping inverts, you can add to the collection. We can go to the next phase, which is breeding. If then, if they don't get fired up by the interest, it doesn't get their attention. The parents don't end up keeping a hamster for the next three years, or the dog for the next ten. Um, at the end of its cycle, nine months or so down the road, when it dies off, that's it, don't keep it again. Some of the people that have started keeping with us have ended up as collectors of dead insects, which is a completely different field as far as I'm concerned. And so they started with their first mantis or, or um, cockroach or whatever it was they kept. It died eventually. They decided to pin it. They've learned about pinning. They've now gone along that route. So you feel keeping insects is not just keeping a pet. It no. gives you opportunities to learn more. Yep. It can open your eyes to, to the natural world. I, I will put my hands up and say that as a kid, I really didn't want to learn at school. I really didn't like school. Um, but through natural history, it made me want to learn because I started keeping reptiles, or I was keeping reptiles, and I wanted to find out where they came from. So I started to learn geography. You want to learn their scientific names, so you start looking at Latin and Greek. You want to learn about temperature control. You start learning elect uh, electrics just to, to heat and keep the things. You learn about light waves and how important they are. So you now start learning about a multitude of things that takes you along the right paths. It, it teaches you what you should be learning to deal with you directly. So I think keeping those pe keeping the beasties makes you look at things in a different way. Well, Graham, thank you so much for talking to us today. Anything. It's been brilliant to learn about the, the, the breeding industry and how it's relevant, not just for selling, no. but for conservation, for research. It's been absolutely fascinating. So thank you for joining us. Anytime. Anytime.